Chapter One of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. Chapter One A Mysterious Gift. Biff Brewster was suddenly awake, wide awake. The grey light of dawn outlined the window of his first-floor bedroom. Something, or someone, was outside. He felt sure of it. Something had prodded him out of his deep sleep with startling suddenness. For a moment he lay still, eyes on the window, his ears sharply tuned for the slightest sound. He knew, of course, that he might have been awakened by a stray dog or a night-prowling cat, but he didn't think so. Very carefully, Biff slipped out of his bed. Barefooted, he padded noiselessly towards the window, taking care to remain outside the dim shaft of early light coming through. He moved to one side of the window and peered out cautiously. He detected a slight movement beneath a gnarled apple tree about thirty feet away. Then, suddenly, swiftly, a figure emerged from behind the protection of the tree's drooping limbs. The figure came at a run towards the window. It was a man, small and slight of build. He was wearing blue jeans and a sweatshirt. On the shirt's front there was an athletic letter. Biff couldn't make it out, cut from luminous cloth, making it glow faintly in the dawn's light. Biff drew back, pressing his body against the wall. A moment later a white object, the size of a baseball, came hurtling into the room, tearing a hole in the screen. It fell with a dull plop on Biff's pillow. Biff held his breath, waiting. The man was leaving the yard on the run. At the sidewalk he slowed to a casual saunter. Apparently he did not want to risk attracting the attention of some early riser. Biff waited. He counted slowly to a hundred to make sure his strange visitor was gone. Once more he looked out of the window. Nothing moved in the eerie light of the dawn. Biff turned away. Had he waited a few seconds longer, he would have seen two men leave the shadows of a corner tree and stealthily follow the hurler of the object. Biff snapped on the reading light by his bed and picked up the object that had been tossed through his window. It was a round white rock, one of those used to outline his mother's herb garden. More interesting was the heavy piece of twine tied tightly round it. At the other end of the twine was a ring. It was a man's heavy ring set with a square-cut green stone. Biff examined it carefully. The stone was dull, not glittering. He wasn't sure, but he thought it was jade. He looked at the ring more closely. On its face there was an intricately etched marking. A design, he wondered? No, it looks more like Chinese writing. Twisted into a knot around the ring was a small piece of paper. Biff unfolded it carefully and smoothed it out. Fortune shines upon, and the gods protect, the wearer of this ring, he read. Protect, Biff thought angrily. Why, that rock could have conked me but good if I hadn't left my bed. Biff reread the printed message. Now what? Just what, he thought, has this got to do with me? He stretched out on his bed, cupping his hands behind his head, and stared at the ceiling. Unable to read any sense into the message, or the mysterious manner in which the ring had come to him, Biff jumped out of bed and made for the shower. Under the pelting needle-like spray, he threw back his broad shoulders and let the water sting his face and soak his light brown hair. Afterward, he toweled himself vigorously, dressed quickly, and placed the ring on his key chain. He knew his father would be up, even though it was only 6.30. Maybe his father would have some ideas about this, or, at least, a couple of good guesses. Biff bounded into the kitchen. Morning, Dad. Say, what do you think happened? He stopped short as he saw his mother come out of the pantry. He didn't want to mention the ring incident in front of her. Not yet, anyway. Not until he had discussed it with his father. He knew his mother already was worried enough about his impending trip to far-off Rangoon. Tomorrow was the day he was leaving. 
Good morning, Biff, his father greeted him. What were you saying? Er, uh, I was just saying it so happens I'm hungry enough to eat a crocodile. Good morning, mother. What's for breakfast? Certainly not crocodile, Mrs. Brewster replied. Even if you and your father do say crocodile steaks are delicious. Ugh. She gave a quick shudder. Father and son looked at one another and smiled. They had had to eat crocodile on their Brazilian adventure, when their food supplies had run short. "'What's on the programme this nice bright Saturday morning?' Biff's mother asked, putting large portions of scrambled eggs and bacon before Biff and his father. Before a reply could be made, Biff's brother and sister, Ted and Monica, eleven-year-old twins, burst into the room. "'Hi, Mum. Hi, Dad,' they shouted together. Gee, Biff, just think, tomorrow you'll be on your way to Rangoon in Burma to visit Uncle Charlie, Ted said enviously. Wish I could go too, Monica chimed in. You? Why, you're a girl, Ted said derisively. Now, no arguments, you two, Mrs. Brewster said. Drink your orange juice. I'll start your eggs. How far from Indianapolis is it to Rangoon, Monica asked. Quite a way, six or seven thousand miles at least, Mr. Brewster replied. You ever been there, Dad? Ted asked. No, I envy Biff. Rangoon is one of the places in this world I've missed so far. And about the only one, Dad, isn't it? Biff asked. There are a few others, his father replied. Maybe if I started out as young as you are, I'd have made them too. For a sixteen-year-old, you've been about this world of ours quite a bit, me boy O. Well, I'm all for it. I am too, Dad, Biff agreed. Remember the time in Brazil when we... Hold it, Mrs. Brewer interrupted, laughing. Don't you two get started talking about your adventures. There's just this one more day before Biff leaves, and my goodness, what a lot has to be done. Biff smiled. He knew there was hardly anything left to be done. His mother had finished packing for him the day before. Just as Mrs. Brewster brought the twins their eggs, the telephone rang. Monica started to get up. She answered every phone call. You sit still and eat those eggs while they're hot, young lady. I'll take the call, Mrs. Brewster said. Biff and his father saw a puzzled look come over her face as she answered the telephone. Yes, I understand. This morning, all right, I'll tell them. When she returned to the breakfast table, she said, That was Charlie's friend, that Chinese merchant, Mr. Ling. Ling Tang, isn't it? Why, yes. What did he want? Tom Brewster asked. He said it is most urgent that you and Biff see him before Biff leaves for Rangoon. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two. Beware, Biff. I think we'd better get down to Ling Tang's shop this morning, Mr. Brewster said. It must be something important for him to have called so early, especially if he knows Biff is leaving for Burma tomorrow. Biff waited until his father had finished his second cup of coffee and then rose from the table. All set, Dad, he asked. I'll get the car. Not until they were in the car did Biff bring up the subject of the ring. What do you think of this, Dad? He took the chain from his pocket, removed the ring, and placed it in his father's hand. Thomas Brewster looked at the ring carefully. It's a beautiful ring, Jade. Where did you get it? Someone threw it at me this morning, Biff said, a grin on his tanned face. Threw it at you? What do you mean? Biff explained quickly, then handed the note to his father. Read this. Mr. Brewster read the words, Fortune shines upon and the gods protect the wearer of this ring. He looked back at his son, shaking his head in puzzlement. This is all? You haven't got any idea who the man was? Not the faintest, Dad. Hmm, Mr. Brewster studied the ring again. Jade, and it looks Chinese. That call from Ling Tang may be connected with this in some way. Hey, maybe you've hit on something, Biff exclaimed. It was nine o'clock when Biff and his father entered the small Chinese curio shop of Ling Tang. 
Ling Tang, a small, neat man in his middle thirties, greeted them with a deep bow. "'You honour my humble establishment by your presence,' he said. "'Rather it is you who honour us by inviting us here,' Mr. Brewster replied, falling easily into the polite form of greeting used by the Chinese." Ling Tan's shop was filled with graceful Chinese urns and vases, beautifully decorated with green and red dragons, flowers, and tree-filled valleys. Chinese fans hung from wires stretched from wall to wall. In glass-covered cases were carved idols of jade and delicate pieces of ivory. A heavy aroma of incense filled the small store. Ling Tang had attended Butler University in Indianapolis with Charles Keene, the uncle Biff was going to visit. They had become close friends, and this had led to a friendship with the entire Brewster family. On graduating, Ling Tang had returned to China. After several years, when the political atmosphere of Red China had put a stern, cruel check on freedom of movement and freedom of speech, Ling Tang had fled his beloved country and returned to America. He had opened his shop and thrived. We received your message, Tang, Mr. Brewster said. Ling Tang placed the tips of his long, well-cared-for fingers together. It is true that your son goes to Burma soon. Yes, tomorrow. Tang's face remained expressionless. Perhaps what I have to tell you is of no importance. I do not wish to alarm you, he paused. This trip was arranged several months ago? Biff and his father nodded their heads. And there has been no attempt to keep it secret? There was no need to, Thomas Brewster stated. I wonder, was the boy's trip not arranged when my good friend Charles Keene visited here last? Yes, but I don't see, Biff began. Your uncle Charles had just returned from Cape Canaveral, has he not? Biff nodded his head. Uncle Charlie had been in the Navy for several years. He was a pilot in the squadron of planes assigned to tracking missiles fired from the Cape into the South Atlantic. It was the squadron's task to recover the instrument-loaded nose cones dropped from the powerful rockets. Uncle Charlie had bounced around the world quite a bit. He had flown a fighter plane during the Korean conflict and had travelled as much as he could about the Orient in his furlough time. He remained in the Navy following Korea, and was delighted when he was assigned to Canaveral. But after two years there, his travelling feet told him, I want out. So he had resigned his commission to join an old pilot friend, establishing a fleet of planes from Explorations Unlimited in Burma. Charles Keane wanted badly to get back to the Orient. He was fascinated by the eastern countries so different from his own. I'm interested in the money, too, he told the Brewster family on his visit. There's plenty of American businesses building up in the Orient. Flying for this outfit in Burma is real opportunity and big money. I want some of both before I'm too old. Explorations Unlimited had its headquarters at Yunheo, on the Irrawaddy River, northeast of Rangoon, near the Chinese border. Why don't you ship Biff out to me for a few weeks, Uncle Charlie had suggested. He could get a glimpse of the other side of the world, learn a lot too. Those words had been music to Biff's young ears. A family council had been held, and it had been agreed that the trip would be a good way for Biff to spend the remainder of his summer vacation. About a month after your uncle's visit, Tang continued, Two men, countrymen of mine, travelling on Burmese passports, arrived here. They asked many questions about your uncle. I still don't see what that has to do with Biff's going to Rangoon, Mr Brewster said. I try your patience, Tang said. Now to my point. Only last night these two same men came again to our city. This time they were most curious about your son, Biff. End of chapter 2、Chapter、three of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Under Chinese Eyes. You said two men, Biff repeated. I just bet you that one of them was the joker who paid me a visit this morning. You had a visitor? 
Early this morning? Ling Tang asked. I say I did. Not a visitor, though. A spy, maybe, sneaking around the yard and... Hold it, Biff, his father interrupted. Why don't you show Mr. Ling what the intruder brought you? Brought me, Biff muttered to himself as he opened the safety catch of his keychain. Some way to bring anything to someone. He removed the ring from a tangle of keys to his footlocker, his suitcase, a secret box, and to several things he had long since forgotten about. Taking the ring by the thick circle of gold, he held it out to the Chinese gentleman. Ling took the ring in his thin hands. He looked at it carefully. A beautiful piece of jade, he murmured. Bringing the ring closer to his eyes, he took a loop, a jeweler's magnifying glass, from his pocket to inspect the ring more minutely. While he did this, Biff filled him in on how the ring had been delivered. Exquisitely carved, Tang said, removing the loop from his eye. What's carved on it? Biff asked. It's the Chinese character which, roughly, would stand for the capital letter K. Does that have any significance for you, Tang? Mr. Brewster asked. Indeed it does. This is the ring of the great house of Quang. Before the communists took over, it was one of the richest and strongest houses in all China. The ring was worn by the great lord of the house and by his sons, the young lords. It's funny I should get one of them, Biff said, laughing. I'm no young lord. Ling Tang smiled. Most mysterious, true, he agreed. And if they wanted to give me a ring, why didn't they just send it to me instead of throwing it through my window and ruining the screen? You did receive it in a most dramatic fashion. You can bet all the tea in China I did, Biff said. Perhaps, young man, Ling said, you received it as you did, so that he who presented it to you could keep his identity a secret. Even more important, Ling paused to drive home his point, he did it to keep you from seeing what he looked like. Biff and his father exchanged concerned glances. Were you acquainted with the house of Quang? Did you know its master? Mr. Brewster asked. It is an old, old family, once strong, once rich. An expression of sadness passed fleetingly across Tang's face. Until the Reds moved in and made ruthless changes, the house of Quang lived in the same age-old feudal manner as had the founder of the family generations ago. They had rich farmlands and houses of many courts. In the old lord's house, he who was called the Ancient One, there were more than a hundred courts. In America you would call them apartments or suites. Each court had its sleeping room, a room for eating, and a room beautifully decorated with a small fish pond in its centre, where the lords of the house would go to think and meditate and honour the memories of their fathers and their fathers' fathers. And this no longer exists? Mr. Brewster asked his friend. Gone, all gone. The farmlands divided up into small communes, the mines, the grain storage house snatched away. But the family still clings together. They still resist. Many of them are in hiding from local red officials. The earthly possessions of the house of Quang have been torn from them. But their family is still a proud one. They aid one another, even to helping the older members escape into the free world. Thomas Brewster had been doing some heavy thinking. Tang, he said, tell me this. In what part of China was the house of Quang located? In the province of Yunnan, south and somewhat west of Cumming, the capital of the province. Mr. Brewster was creating the map of China in his mind's eye. That would be near the border of Burma. Ling Tang nodded his head gravely. Not far from Yumheo, on the Irrawaddy River... Bill's father inquired. Your memory of China is excellent, my friend. Once the old lord, Teo Kwang, made annual pilgrimages to Rangoon to visit the shrine of the Guatama Buddha, the magnificent pagoda of Shui Dagon. Biff was beginning to put the pieces together. I still don't get it loud and clear, but Uncle Charlie's located at Uhea. That's where I'm going, and Uncle Charlie's in Rangoon a lot, isn't he? Yes, Biff, he is. 
But the ring, why would somebody want me to have it? Do you suppose they want me to take it with me? That, my boy, is the question we'd all like to have the answer to, Mr. Brewster replied. Gosh, maybe I shouldn't take the ring with me. Tang spoke up quickly. Oh, but I think you should. Its manner of delivery hints of peril, but its message speaks of fortune and safety. Biff took the ring back. As he did so, a young, smiling Chinese entered the store hurriedly. So sorry, revered elder cousin, so sorry to be late. I change quickly and take over my duties. Tang smiled as the young Chinese hurried to the rear of the store. Biff had noticed the young man was wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. On the front of the shirt was the letter K. Biff turned and looked sharply after him. Who was that, sir? Biff inquired of Ling Tang. My young cousin, one of them, Tang said. He works afternoons for the Kirby Ice Cream Company. He is much enthused about your game of softball. He is of the team called the Kirby Coolers. Well, thanks for your information, Tang. Guess we'd better get going, Mr. Brewster said. I'll say hello to Uncle Charlie for you, Mr. Ling, Biff said. That will be most kind of you, the Chinese replied. Both bowed to Ling Tang, and he returned their gesture with a deep bow of his own. Biff and his father were thoughtful as they walked to their parked car. Something was building. No doubt about that. But what? What was the answer to, or the connection between the spying stranger at the ring and Biff's coming to visit his Uncle Charlie? The answer to those questions were not to be found that day. At home, Mrs. Brewster's first question was, Biff, who ruined the screen in your room? Biff looked helplessly at his father, who merely shrugged his shoulders. A rock, mother, this morning early, fooling around. I thought, young man, you were old enough to know better than to toss rocks around carelessly. Biff heaved a sigh of relief. He was going to get out of this easily. Neither he nor his father wanted to tell Mrs. Brewster the real reason for the hole in the screen. They didn't want to worry her. Now, Mrs. Brewster said briskly, we've lots to do today. We'll have no time in the morning. We'll have to leave for the airport early. Now here's what I want you to do, Biff. On the morning of his departure, Biff again woke early. He could hear noises throughout the house and sniffed at the friendly smells of breakfast being prepared. Everybody was up. They were all going with him to the airport. Biff looked at his watch. It was nearly seven by the time he was dressed. In one hour and fifteen minutes, he would be airborne on his way to Chicago, the first leg in a journey that would take him halfway round the world. Breakfast was a funny kind of a meal that morning. Not the food, but the way the whole family acted. The twins, of course, kept up a steady, excited chatter. Any trip to the airport made them bubble like a bottle of pop. But Biff and his mother and father either all tried to talk at the same time or suddenly remained silent at the same time. Biff gets all the breaks, Ted complained. Don't see why I can't go too. Because you're too young, that's why, retorted his twin sister, Monica. You're just eleven. You are too, the younger boy shot back. Way you act, anybody think you were older than me. Your time will come, Ted, Mr. Brewster said, acting as a peacemaker between his youngest children. When you're five years older, like Biff, the world will still be here. There'll be plenty of chances for you to spread your wings and fly. Right, said Ted emphatically, and I'll go by rocket. But what about me? I'm a girl, Monica wailed. Yes, Tom, answer that one, Martha Brewster said with a laugh. Don't worry, Monica, she continued. We women will show these men a thing or two. Like what, the girl said, pouting. Like how fast you can get ready, right now. We have to leave for the airport. As they drove into the busy terminal, Biff felt a lump in the pit of his stomach. First signs of homesickness, he thought. It had happened before. Biff always felt homesick at these last moments. But once he was underway, the feeling left him, except sometimes late at night, just before he fell asleep. This time, though, it was different. This was the first time Biff was going to be all on his own. Before, his adventures had been shared with his father. True, he'd been with his Uncle Charlie, but as nice a guy as Uncle Charlie was, 
uncles weren't the same as fathers. Biff checked in and had his ticket cleared. At the gate, he ruffled his brother's hair, gave him a quick hug and turned to Monica. He lifted her off her feet and planted a big smack on her plump cheek. Unashamedly, he embraced his mother in front of the crowded gate, then turned to his father. The two shook hands and Mr. Bruce had placed a hand on Biff's shoulder. You have the ring in a safe place, he asked softly. Biff nodded his head and touched his side trouser pocket. He had fastened a key chain to a longer, stronger chain, which was attached to his belt loop. I wouldn't display it, Biff. Biff nodded. He felt tears coming to his eyes, but he was through the gate and up the plane's loading platform before anyone could see them. Moments later, the plane was taxiing out to the runway for the takeoff. Biff, looking through the window, could see his family waving. After the plane's four engines had been warmed up and tested, the giant airliner lurched forward, and in seconds was airborne. First stop Chicago, changed to a jet liner for San Francisco. Next stop Hawaii, then Tokyo, Hong Kong, and finally Rangoon. Biff unfastened his seatbelt when the lighted sign snapped off and looked about him. The plane was only half filled. He glanced to the rear and his heart started pounding. Seated in the last seat on the plane's starboard side were two Chinese. They returned Biff's stare without expression. One of them, Biff noticed, seemed to have but one good eye. The other eye was nothing but a thin slit. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Fortune Cookie Biff's connections at Chicago with the jetliner for San Francisco went without a hitch. In less than an hour the sleek, silvery plane was in the air, circling over the bustling city of Chicago. It pointed its slender nose westward and began to race with the sun to the Pacific Ocean. The liner seemed to hang motionless over the broad plains of the west. Even the towering peaks of the Rocky Mountains passed backward beneath the plain slowly, as if the plain were barely moving, instead of slicing through the air at nearly 700 miles per hour. Once they were in the air, Biff, as casually as he could, had let his eyes sweep the length of the plain, trying to see if the two Chinese were still with him. There were no Orientals on this flight. By the early afternoon the plane had left the mountains behind it and was starting its long glide to lose altitude as it neared San Francisco. Far ahead Biff could see the blue waters of the Pacific sparkling under the rays of the sun, now standing high in the sky. Before he realised it, the plane was circling over San Francisco Bay. Biff saw the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge arching gracefully over the harbour. After a two-hour layover, during which time Biff's papers and baggage were cleared by customs, the boy boarded the plane which was to take him to his final destination, Burma. The sun had a good lead on the plane by the time the huge airliner took off. It would soon disappear over the horizon and darkness would greet the touchdown in Honolulu. Once the plane was over the water, Biff turned in his seat for a final glance at his homeland. He could just see the hills of San Francisco fading rapidly behind him. As he turned more towards the front, his eye was caught by two Chinese passengers. Biff looked at them closely. They were dressed in long flowing robes. The robes were brightly coloured in greens and reds and were gold trimmed. Their wearers had tight skull caps worn low on their foreheads and each wore heavy dark sunglasses. Could they be the same two who had been on the plane with him from Indianapolis to Chicago? For a closer look, Biff walked to the rear of the plane for a drink of water. He stood just in back of the pair and inspected the men closely. They could be the same men, he decided, but he couldn't be sure. It was difficult for him to tell one Chinese from another, and the change, if these were the same two, from American clothes to Oriental, made such a difference that it was impossible for Biff to be certain. Biff decided on a bold move. He stopped at the seat where the two Orientals sat impassively, staring straight ahead. "'I'm going to Rangoon,' he said, a friendly smile breaking out on his face. 
to a place very near the Chinese border. Are you going to Rangoon or Hong Kong? There was no answer. Don't you speak English? Biff asked. I'm afraid they don't, a voice said behind him. Biff whirled. It was the stewardess. Can I help you? she asked. No, Biff said lamely. I was just, uh, just going to get a glass of water. The stewardess moved on, biffed down the glass of water which he didn't need, and started back to his seat. As he came to the side where the Chinese were sitting, he decided to try a little trick. He bent towards the floor of the plane. Is that your glasses case on the floor? he asked. The Chinese in the outside seat bent forward. His hand reached down, feeling by his feet. Then quickly realizing he had given himself away, he sat up straight and stared ahead. A big smile of satisfaction decorated Biff's face as he settled himself in his seat. He knew one thing about them at least. They understood English, but good. And they could have taken another airline from Chicago to San Francisco. Biff's swift flight was without further incident as the plane sped across the Pacific. Then he was on the last leg, the flight from Hong Kong to Rangoon. It was the middle of the afternoon, an hour after the takeoff from Hong Kong. Rangoon was still nearly three hours away. The stewardesses were serving tea. With it they served almond cookies, and, as a favour from the airlines, each passenger received a fortune cookie, a small, delicate piece of folded, crisply cooked dough. Inside each fortune cookie was a narrow ribbon of paper, on which was printed a short saying, usually humorous. Biff remembered them from the Chinese restaurant he went to with the family every so often back in Indianapolis. He smiled as he remembered one he had once gotten. It read, Man who count chicken before they hatch is egghead. Biff finished his tea. He reached for the fortune cookie. Just as he did so, someone lurched against his shoulder, upsetting the tray. Cup, saucer and fortune cookie fell to the floor. Both Biff and the awkward passenger reached to pick up the scrambled tray. Biff's eyes met his helpers. It was one of the two Chinese. There was no reason for him to have stumbled. The plane was flying smoothly. It appeared to Biff that the shoulder bumping had been intentional. So sorry, the Chinese said. His dark glasses glinted as he straightened up. Too bad. Fortune cookies smashed to bits. But slipper paper still okay. Smiling briefly, he handed Biff the slender slip of tissue paper and made his way hurriedly forward. Biff watched him go, still puzzled by the man's action. The boy smoothed out the slip. It had only a Chinese character scrawled on it. Through the Chinese printing had been drawn a red X. Now what the dickens is this, Biff thought. He started to crumble the paper but something about it held his attention. There was something familiar about it. Then he had it. Carefully he took out his keychain. He bent low and compared the character on the cookie slip with that on the surface of the ring's green stone. They were identical. The letter K, the seal of the lords of the house of Quang. Was this a warning of some kind? Did the red X cancel out the protection and good fortune the ring was supposed to ensure? But why? Why? Biff's brain kept signalling that one word with its question mark. The plane climbed over the coastal mountains of Vietnam, dropped down to skim over the rice fields of Thailand, then swung out over the Bay of Bengal for its approach to Rangoon. As the plane banked, Biff could see the many mouths of the Irrawaddy River spread out like long fingers from the broad brown arm of the river itself. The plane came low over the bay on its approach to the city, and Biff could see the colourful sails of the Dows, the native craft which dotted the harbour. Some of the sails were bright red, some dirty brown. Many wore patches of every colour of the rainbow. The plane followed the course of the Huang River, twenty-one miles inland to the city of Rangoon. Standing out against the low white buildings, Biff saw the pagoda of Shui Dagon, rising nearly four hundred feet skyward. 
it was entirely covered with gold leaf which glistened in the setting sun then he remembered ling lang had told him this was the important shrine of buddha where the head of the house of kwang used to worship biff stretched and twisted in spite of the cookie accident and the red x he smiled almost there at last he said to the passing stewardess the long trip had been pleasant enough but being confined to a plane for three days and three nights had become monotonous just as soon as he could biff bounded down the ramp from the airliner and ran eagerly to the entrance of the airport terminal through the portal into the terminal biff was caught up in a swirling mass of figures fat merchants skinny students long robe mandarins ragged beggars and men in the uniforms of all the world's military forces milled about the huge room biff searched the crowds trying to spot his uncle charlie he was nowhere to be seen worried minutes followed then biff saw a tall very thin oriental wearing a long straight white robe approach the man came up to biff with hands clasped to his chest he bowed low sahib brewster he asked i'm biff brewster the boy answered thinking gee i'm a sahib i come from sahib charles keen he had planned to meet you however an emergency arose and he had to fly to the north but he should be back at uheo by the time we get there oh biff was slightly shaken by this unexpected turn of events and how do we get there then it is all arranged another pilot was dispatched to pick you up when your uncle was unable to come himself come if you will follow me even now the plane is ready the oriental turned and a path in the human mass seemed to open for him biff followed still not sure of this man hey he called wait a minute the oriental paused and turned to the boy i'd like to know your name biff said i don't like calling people just hey the oriental's puzzled expression changed to a slight smile as understanding of biff's hey came to him i am called nam palung head of the servants in your uncle's house okay nam but what about getting through customs that is all arranged your uncle is a man of much importance and influence come we must hurry before darkness spreads its mantle upon the land biff didn't like being rushed like this yeah but what about my luggage my suitcase and trunk even now they precede us to the plane all is cared for the whole business seemed a bit cockeyed to biff but then shrugging his shoulders he followed nam to the northern exit of the terminal nam walked quickly his far short steps limited by the skirt of his robe even so biff had to step up his pace to stay with the man suspicion again came to biff as they left the terminal building and appeared to be taking a direction away from the airport look nam just where are we going the airstrips are back that way those sahib brewster nam replied are for the commercial airlines planes private planes such as those used by explorations unlimited use a different part of the field biff's suspicions dropped a degree nam's explanation made sense his suspicions dropped still further when nam reached a jeep and with a low bow indicated that biff was to get in an american jeep biff thought they're found everywhere the small vehicle represented home and safety to biff he hopped aboard and nam took his place behind the wheel biff looked across the airport where a mile away several small planes were clustered he figured that was where they were heading he heard a rustling behind him and turned abruptly in the jeep's rear seat now sat as if they had appeared out of thin air two more orientals both were dressed like nam but as biff looked at them more closely he noticed that each man's hand was partly thrust into a fold of his robe and each hand clasped the hilt of a slender dagger biff turned to nam alarmed who are those men with knives his voice shook in spite of his attempt to control it nam interrupted his manner was no longer courteous his voice no longer smooth his reply was stem and harsh you will remain silent any outcry any attempt to escape 
and my men have been told to use those knives. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jack Hudson Nam Palung meant business. There was no question about that. But Biff had no intention of yielding without a struggle. He would make his escape if at all possible. Right now, as his mind whirled trying to think his way out of this predicament, it would be best to do exactly as he had been told. Biff promised himself one thing. Once he was free of Nam Palung, he, Biff Brewster, was going to give himself one swift kick. He had been played for a sucker, a trusting, easy-to-take American, and he had filled the role perfectly. How, he now thought, could he have been so taken in? The jeep rolled across the field. Biff shot a sidelong glance at Nam Palung. The jeep moved at a steady pace, not fast enough to attract attention. It was headed towards a gate in the high wire fence surrounding the airfield through which service trucks passed. He noticed that the gate was blocked by an iron bar, raised to allow a vehicle to pass underneath it. When raised, the bar on its upright poles looked like a football goalpost. As the jeep drew near and fell in line behind a truck and a small car, Biff noticed the bar was raised just sufficiently to allow about a foot's clearance for the vehicle passing underneath. An idea came into Biff's head. He turned to look over his shoulder at his knife-bearing guards. Keep your head straight forward, Nam ordered, and no tricks as we pass the gateman. Biff watched the truck ahead pass through. It slowed down without stopping as it passed under the raised bar. The bar was lowered to stop position after the truck's tailgate went through. Next came the smaller car, its roof much lower than the truck's. Again the bar was raised, but this time just high enough to accommodate the car, leaving about two feet between it and the car's top. Now the jeep approached the bar barricade. The bar began rising slowly. Biff watched it, his heart in his mouth. Don't let them raise it too high, he prayed. Biff leaned slightly forward, placing his weight on his firmly planted feet. He tensed his leg and thigh muscles until they felt like tightly coiled steel springs. The bar was about three feet higher than tall Nam's head. Biff waited until the front of the jeep was directly under the bar. Then he leapt up as if he had been blasted off a launching pad. His hand seized the bar. Like a trapeze artist, he swung his body forward in a giant arc. At the top of his swing, when his body was parallel to the ground, Biff twisted his head, looked over his shoulder as his body started a swift downward stroke. At the split second, he lashed out with his feet. One foot struck the left knife wielder square on the side of his head. The man shot over the side of the jeep as if jerked by the hand of a giant. Biff's other foot struck the second knife wielder fully in his chest, toppling him out of the back of the jeep. Now Biff was propelling himself into the backwards arc of this swing. Again his body came swiftly downwards. He lashed at Nam, planted both feet solidly in the oriental shoulders. Nam shot forward, his head striking the windshield. Biff swung his body sideways and dropped to the ground. He ran back towards the terminal building, nearly half a mile away. After a hundred yards he slowed to catch his breath. Turning he looked back at the jeep. There was no need to run. Nam still lay sprawled over the steering wheel. One of the knife bearers was out of sight, apparently still sprawled on the ground on the other side of the jeep. The other guard was just rising from behind the jeep. Biff saw him stagger, still not fully recovered. There would be no more trouble with those three, Biff said to himself. Not right away at any rate. The boy continued toward the terminal building at a rapid walk. He didn't run, no need to and if he did, he might attract attention. He might be stopped. Explanations would be demanded. The gatekeeper might come up and describe what had happened. Biff needed time to think. What was his next move? Guess I'll have to play it by ear, he told himself. And what, he wondered, had happened to Uncle Charlie? Had he been waylaid by those same three? Inside the teeming terminal building, Biff mingled with the constantly moving crowds. 
He hoped he wouldn't be noticeable, but there was little chance of that. In his American clothes, grey slacks and open-necked shirt, he was as noticeable as an Oriental dressed in Mandarin clothes would have been at the Indianapolis airport. There was only one thing to do, Biff decided. Go to the airline check-in counter and see if any message has been left for him by his uncle. The boy approached the counter cautiously. He wanted to look around before identifying himself. Biff sidled up to the counter. A tall, handsome man, about thirty years old, was leaning over the counter, questioning the clerk intensely. He was wearing white drill trousers and a white shirt open at the collar. A well-shaped, close-cropped head topped a strong neck and broad shoulders. He spoke to the clerk in a voice filled with authority. Unless he was badly fooled again, Biff felt sure that this man was an American, and there was something about him that the boy liked immediately. Hold it, Biff said to himself. Let's not jump too fast this time. Standing behind the man, Biff saw him take out a worn wallet from his hip pocket. Now you listen to me. I'm Jack Hudson. I'm a pilot for Explorations Unlimited. Here, take a look at my papers. I'm here to meet a boy named Biff Brewster, and I want to know where he is. Right now. The clerk leaned on the counter. He carefully inspected the list of names on the paper in front of him. So shall the no name like one you say on the list. Is that your passenger manifest list? the man Jack Hudson demanded. The clerk nodded his head. Without asking, without waiting, Hudson snatched the list from the man's hand. Here, you can't do that. Hudson ignored the clerk. His eye ran down the list quickly. At just what do you think this name is? Hudson held his index finger beside one of the names. Oh, so sorry. I guess I no understand your talk. Fat chance, Hudson said angrily. Now you just tell me where that boy is. Biff had made up his mind. He couldn't be mistaken in this man of action. I think you're looking for me, sir, Biff said, and placed his hand on Jack Hudson's arm. Hudson swung round. He looked Biff up and down, slowly, carefully, sizing him up, before answering. If I weren't so glad to see you, I'd ask where the devil you've been. Then, seeing Biff's face fall, Hudson smiled a warm, immediately friendly smile. But the important thing is I've found you. I guess it's mostly my fault that you've had trouble meeting me, Biff confessed. I had a little mix-up with... He cut his sentence short. Perhaps he had better wait until he got to know Jack Hudson better, before revealing all the mysterious happenings that had taken place from that early hour in the morning four days ago, back in Indianapolis. Well, part of it's my fault too, Jack said, or the weathers. Coming in from Yunhaya, I ran into a terrific headwind. Should have allowed for it. These winds spring up all the time in these parts. I was late. But come on now, we've got to clear you with customs and get your gear. Jack Hudson, with a forcefulness sharp enough to cut any red tape, literally bulldozed Biff through a maze of inspections, checks and rechecks. I'm slipping, he grinned at Biff when the boy had been cleared. Took me thirty-one minutes. My record's twenty-nine. Come on, we've got to make with the plane back to Nheo. Fast. Lots to be done. That suits me. I'm anxious to see my uncle. Hope he's there when we get back. A frown creased Jack's face as he spoke. He will be, won't he? That's what I was told, that the emergency came up quickly and... Biff ended his sentence feeling foolish. He suddenly remembered who had told him the story. Emergency? I don't know of any emergency. Your uncle wasn't even in Unheo today. It was arranged for me to pick you up before he left. Before he left? What do you mean? Biff was getting puzzled. Your uncle flew out of Unheo over a week ago. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interrupted Message Darkness had spread over the airfield by the time Biff and Jack Hudson reached the Explorations plane. It was a twin-engine Cessna, a five-passenger, capable of speeds of 250 miles per hour. Hop in, Biff, Jack said. Be my co-pilot. Jack stowed Biff's gear and took his place in the pilot's seat. 
As quick to action as Hudson was, he was also a sober, careful pilot. He warmed up the plane's motors. He tested the wing flaps. He made a thorough instrument check. Then he called the tower for take-off instructions. The plane moved to its assigned runway. Once more Jack revved up his engines. Then the brakes released, the plane started rolling down the runway. Once it was airborne, Jack put the plane in a steep climb, made a wide circle over the city of Rangoon, then headed north, following the Irrawaddy River. How long before we get there? Biff asked. About four hours, if we don't hit any weather. Nunhea's about fifty miles north of Mayit Kiena. About eleven hundred miles from here. How big's Unheo? Is it much of a place? Biff asked. Jack grinned. Take a look back at Rangoon. That's the last civilization you're going to see for a while. The plane sped through the night. As the moon rose out of the South China Sea, its light turned the Irrawaddy River, thousands of feet below, into a slender silvery ribbon, reflecting the moon's rays like a long sliver of mirror. Jack Hudson put the plane on automatic pilot. He reached behind him and brought out two boxes. He handed one to Biff. Hungry? Biff hadn't thought about eating, but now he realized he was ravenous. I'll say I am. Thanks a lot. He practically tore open the box and chomped on the sandwiches with an appetite that made Jack wonder when the boy had last eaten. Just before midnight, Hudson switched on the plane's radio transmitter and called the landing strip at Unheo. Keep your eyes dead ahead for the next few minutes, he told Biff. I always get a thrill out of it. He did as he was told. He peered intently through the windshield into the night. Clouds had obscured the moon, and all was darkness. Not a light could be seen anywhere. Suddenly, as if by magic, the letter X blazed out of the jungle, twenty miles ahead. It was so startling that Biff gasped in amazement. Our landing field. I told them we'd be in in about ten minutes, and so to turn on the lights. We have two runways, one from southwest to northeast, the other from southeast to northwest. They bisect in the center, forming a perfect X. I think it's a wonderful sight. It sure is, Biff replied. For the next few minutes, Jack's entire attention was devoted to the landing. The plane swooped out of the dark, flashed over the landing field, circled and entered its final glide path. Biff felt the lurch which told him they had touched down. Jack taxied the plane toward the hangars. Well, here we are, he said to Biff. Welcome to Unheo. Despite the excitement of landing in this strange isolated spot in Upper Burma, Biff couldn't hold back a yawn. He was just plain dog-tired. It had been four nights since he had slept in a bed. Oh, he had slept, but sleeping in a sitting position, he told himself, would never replace the good old stretch-out type of snooze. Native servants swarmed round the plane. Biff and his gear were deposited in a jeep standing by. Jack hopped behind the wheel. The jeep, with natives clinging to every possible foot and handhold, headed through the night towards Headquarters House, a quarter of a mile away. Headquarters House was a combination of office, communications centre and living quarters for the staff of Explorations Unlimited. Sleeping rooms, resembling those of bachelor officers' quarters on an army post, filled one end of the building. Into one of these went Biff. Moments after his head hit the pillow, he was in a deep sleep, in spite of the murky heat that was unrelieved by the lateness of the night. Around five o'clock in the morning, as dawn was transforming the night blackened jungle into a greenish maze, Biff was awakened by the sound of running feet passing his door. These were followed by others. The whole building seemed to spring to life. Something was up. Biff jumped out of bed. First he went to the window. Looking out he saw a tremendous animal faintly outlined in the morning mist, not more than thirty feet away. Just as he was about to call out, he saw the floppy ears and the swaying trunk of the animal raised towards the sky 
and let go with a trumpeting that rattled the windows. Biff had to smile at himself. What was an elephant doing wandering around loose at that time of the morning? Some difference from home, he thought. Biff dressed quickly. He hurried down the hallway toward the centre of headquarters house. Sounds of activity came from the communication centre. He paused in the doorway. Jack Hudson and two other men were bunched together around a short-wave receiver. Static crackled throughout the room. One of the men picked up a hand microphone. This is HH1 calling. This is Happy Harry 1 calling X0369. Come in X0369. Repeat. Come in X0369. We were beginning to read you. Acknowledge. Do you read us? His answer was a roar of static. Jack Hudson shook his head. His concern and the intense looks on the faces of the other men told Biff they were troubled. Was it Keen, Mike? Jack demanded. Was it Charlie? Biff heard Jack's question, and he felt a sudden pang of fear. The radio operator, Mike Dawson, shook his head. I can't say for sure. I think it must have been, but the voice was so faint and static. Could you make out anything? Any of the words? Jack's voice was insistent. Mike shook his head worriedly. The sender didn't identify. I did think I caught some of the words, but I can't say for sure. Well, what were they, man? What were they? I, I thought, he said, they were coming for me. My position is Latty. And right then the transmission broke off completely. That's when I buzzed your rooms. I've been working this mic ever since, and getting nothing but nothing. Biff stepped into the room. He crossed to the three men. Was that my uncle you were talking about? Mike and the other man looked at Jack Hudson. It was obvious that they wouldn't speak unless he gave them the go-ahead. Jack looked at Biff. He didn't reply at once. Then, having reached his decision, he answered, Yes, Biff, I'm afraid it was. Afraid? Biff felt a tingle of fear race up his spine. What do you mean? Is my uncle in danger? Jack Hudson's shoulders sagged. He shook his head, as if trying to rid himself of unpleasant thoughts. Come along, Biff, I'll tell you about it over some coffee. At the door he turned back. Keep trying, Mike. You might raise him. And if you do, I'll buzz you fast. In the mess hall, the servants had already set the breakfast table. Two of them padded about the room silently on their bare feet. Biff sat down to a plate containing an oval-shaped reddish fruit, streaked with white. It's the fruit of the durian tree. Try it. We think it's delicious. If you don't like it, though, there's fresh pineapple or guava. The taste was like nothing Biff had ever eaten before. He didn't know whether he liked it or not. And he didn't care. There were more important things than breakfast fruit right now. Tell me about Uncle Charlie. Jack sipped some coffee. I'll tell you what I can, Biff. It won't be much. I don't know it all myself. I know where he went, and I think I know why. The why is what I can't tell you. Was there danger in this trip of Uncle Charlie's? Danger? Perhaps. Always dangerous crossing the border, but Charlie should have been able to handle it. Biff felt his heart pound. Your uncle left here exactly eight days ago. He left early in the morning. He needed the cover of night to fly across the border. The border? What border? Biff asked. The border into Red China. That border's closed, you know, especially to Americans. Jack paused to light a cigarette. He took off in a light, four-place plane. It's the type of plane that Charlie could land or take off in on a dime. It carried extra fuel tanks. How long did he expect to be gone? He didn't know for certain. Not more than four or five days, he said. Four or five days, Biff thought, and eight days had passed. We've been expecting him watching for him. 
I've flown from dawn to daylight myself in the last three days, hoping to spot him or his plane, if he was forced down. Nothing. He didn't break radio silence once from the time he left. Until this morning, Biff cut in. Yes, until this morning, if that was Charlie. Have you any idea where he was going in China? Jack shook his head. Not exactly. With the extra tanks, he had fuel for about 1,200 miles. So, since he had to return, he must have expected to find what he was looking for not more than 500 miles inside China. And you can't tell me your ideas of what his search was for. Jack hesitated. All I can tell you would be the results of my own speculations. Your uncle was at Cape Canaveral, as you know, and he must know a lot about guided missiles. He was one of the Navy's top young officers. Well, put your thinking cap on. Maybe between us we can come up with something. Biff thought hard. There were many parts to this puzzle. He thought he himself was probably one of them. But fitting them together into an answer, that would take more than minutes, hours or even days to do. Too many important parts of the puzzle were still missing. Biff thought that perhaps now he should fill Jack in on his own small mystery. His hand went to his keychain and touched the jade ring. He made a decision. He wouldn't mention the ring. He would only tell Jack about what had happened when he arrived at the Rangoon airport. Quickly he told Jack the story. As he poured it out rapidly, Jack's look of worried concern deepened. There must be some connection. Charlie disappears, and you're almost kidnapped. Describe the man again. Biff sketched the three men in as best he could. I only saw the one called Nam Palung closely. He said he was the number one man here at Explorations. Never heard of him. Was he Chinese or Burmese? I'd say Chinese, Biff answered, although I don't really know how Burmese look. Jack was thoughtful. But Jack, Biff said, we're not just going to sit here, are we? Can't we do something? Can't we go into China and find Uncle Charlie? Go into China? Impossible. You get any such idea out of your head. That idea, though, was very much in Biff's head. The idea had been growing from the moment he first heard of his uncle's disappearance. I mean that, Jack said. You have no idea of the difficulty in crossing the border. It's patrolled night and day, and the border guards shoot to kill. Man and boy sat in silence, both deep in thought. The silence was suddenly broken. A native boy about Biff's age, but smaller, came running into the room. Sahib Jack, come on, run! Come on, run! Quick, quick! He ran out of the room. Biff and Jack were at his heels. End of chapter 6、Chapter 7 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 a spirited box. The native boy raced across the open compound towards the group of low buildings where the servants slept. Jack and Biff ran side by side ten feet behind the boy. What is it, Chuba? What is it? Jack called, but the boy didn't answer until he reached the door of one of the small white cabins. There he stopped, gasping for breath, and turned to Jack and Biff. His face was contorted with fear. His eyes were open wide and filled with terror. Now get hold of yourself, Chuba. Steady, we're right here. What's inside your cabin that's so frightening? Chuba's voice trembled as he spoke. The evil ones, they come. They come to punish Chuba and the father of Chuba. The evil ones, what are you talking about? Jack's voice was firm, but his tone was kind. He had to quiet this boy's fears. It has been spoken, Chuba said, his voice trembling, many, many years ago, the gods spoke to the ancestors of my father. They said, and here the boy's voice almost broke, they said that evil will befall any member of the house of Chin Fu who leaves his land to become a slave of the white man. 
Biff watched the boy. He felt sympathy towards him, yet it was hard for Biff to believe that such superstitious beliefs could still cast their spell in these modern days. That's nonsense, Chuba. You and your father are not slaves. You are honourable workers. Without your help, we could not live here. You are well paid, and you hold positions of responsibility and dignity. Enough of this. Just what is inside your cabin? Chuba not know, but is bad, very bad. It is voices of the evil ones casting spell on Chuba and his honourable father. All right, come on and show us what it is. Please, Sahib Jack, you to go first. Okay, come on, Biff. Jack and Biff entered the one-room cabin. It was small but comfortably furnished. Beds stood against the walls on either side of the room. At the rear there was a small, compact kitchen. Biff and Jack inspected the room quickly. They saw nothing unusual. Chuba stood behind them, standing on tiptoes. There, he said, watch, and you shall hear evil spirits. He pointed to a small box on the floor by one of the beds. As they watched, a low growl came from the box. The growl grew louder. It became a wail. Then it turned into the high, piercing scream of a siren. It held this chilling, blood-curdling pitch for about ten seconds. Then the lid of the box slowly raised. A yellowish hand emerged. It bent over the front of the box. One finger touched a small button. The high scream dropped down to a wail, then to a growl then stopped. The hand withdrew into the box, the lid closed. All was silent again. Biff put a restraining hand on Chuba, keeping the boy from fleeing in terror. On Biff's face, a slow grin was spreading. He wanted to laugh, but one glance at Chuba's stricken face stopped him. This was a serious thing to Chuba. Chuba would feel Biff was laughing at him, insulting him. Jack stared at the box in amazement. Now, just what on earth is that thing? He scratched his head. Biff started across the room towards the box. Hold it, Biff. We don't know what that gadget might be. Might be a bomb. Now Biff did laugh. Even Jack was concerned. Not terror-stricken like Chuba, but the weird performance of the box had undoubtedly alarmed Jack. Biff reached for the box bent over and picked it up. Chuba cowed behind Jack, but the native boy's curiosity got the better of him. He watched Biff's every move, his eyes wide. It's only a toy, Jack, Biff said. My kid brother got one last Christmas. It was the newest thing out, caused a sensation. Let me take a look at it, Jack said, and Biff handed it to him. A great feeling of relief had come over Biff, when Chuba had come rushing in, crying out in a voice filled with fright, Biff had figured that another of the series of strange happenings had taken place. To discover that all the excitement was only about a toy relaxed Biff completely for the first time since he had arrived in the Orient. Jack inspected the toy somewhat gingerly. How does it work? Biff took the box back. Look, I'll show you. He raised the lid of the box, and as he did so, Chuba took a step back. He was taking no chances with evil spirits, even if the Americans did. Jack's and Biff's heads were together inspecting the box. This was too much for Chuba. He had to see too. He cautiously poked his head forward for a closer look. See this small siren? That's where the noises come from. The toy has two small batteries, like the ones used in a transistor radio. They power this small motor and it does the rest, raises the lid and makes this hand snake out. Biff looked at Chuba and smiled. A shy, friendly grin lit up the native boy's face. Want to see it work with the lid open? Chuba nodded his head rapidly. Biff set the toy in motion. The siren reached its high pitch. The hand, attached to the end of a small iron rod, snaked out, flopped over the front side of the box and touched the cut-off button. That's all there is to it. Some gadget, isn't it? Jack laughed. I can see how it must have been the toy sensation of last Christmas. I can also see why it scared the daylights out of Chuba. It would scare me, too, if it woke me up from a sound sleep. 
That's what happened, Sahib Jack. I sleep deep. The thing started screaming. Chubba jump, run fast, plenty scared for help. I suppose once it's turned on, it keeps operating until the batteries run out. That's right, Biff said. The action is set so it goes off once about every three minutes. You turn it off here. Biff pointed to a switch on the bottom of the box. But how it get into my father's house this morning, Chuba demanded. I can answer that one. Jack's shoulders started shaking with laughter. Biff started laughing too, partly from relief and partly because when Jack laughed, everyone joined in. Chuba, his eyes darting from Jack to Biff, decided his worries had passed. He giggled shyly at first, then added his laugh to the chorus. The little white cabin shook with their hilarity. The evil one, Chuba, Jack said, is a certain red-headed maintenance mechanic called Muscles. Muscles? Him play another joke on Chuba. He much cool fellow. Him way in. What's this, Biff thought? Jive talk from a native boy? This kid's all right. You mean this Muscles is real cool? He's way out, don't you, Chuba? Biff asked. That's what Chuba say. He here, man, here. Biff slapped his thighs and doubled up again with glee. Chuba's mixed-up talk was so far gone, it had come back to here. How old are you, Chuba? Jack asked. Chuba drew himself fully erect. He puffed out his chest. Chuba soon be sixteen. Aren't you about the same, Biff? Biff nodded his head. Chuba shake hands with Biff Brewster, Biff Sahib Charlie's nephew. The boy shook hands. There was no doubt but that they took to one another right off. Chuba, you show Biff around. I've got to get back and see if Mike's been able to... I get it, Jack, Biff said. The two boys watched Jack stride back to headquarters house. Come, Sahib Biff, I show you many things. Biff didn't reply at once. A plan was beginning to shape up in his head. It would work, too, with the help of Chuba. OK, Chuba, but first off, cut out that sahib stuff. To you, I'm just plain Biff. End of chapter 7、Chapter、8 Of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Still Missing. The friendship between Biff and Chuba developed rapidly. Chuba was an odd boy with his mixed up jive talk, his quick oriental mind, and his desperate anxiety to be like American kid. He was half a head shorter than Biff. He had long, black, wiry hair, usually plastered down with smelly hair tonics. These he got from muscles. The burly mechanic tried every new hair conditioner that came along in an attempt to control his unruly light brown hair. Chuba's skin was dark, so deeply tanned that its yellowish tinge from his Chinese blood hardly showed. He looked more Burmese than Chinese. His daily clothes were a pair of hand me down brown shorts and hand made sandals, ideal for the heavy, humid weather which turned the jungle enclosed camp into a smoking oven. The shorts Chuba got from the Americans in the camp. Chuba did his own alterations on the shorts to cut them down to size. He was far from an expert tailor. One pair had the left leg. Six inches longer than the right. Another pair, handed down from a man with a forty four inch waist, gave Chuba a laughable balloon effect in the rear, particularly when he ran. Biff's second day at the camp in Unheo began with a visit to the communications room. Mike Dawson, the radio operator, merely shook his head at the question written on Biff's face. No word from Uncle Charlie. Biff hurried through breakfast. He left Headquarters House, stepping into a blazing sun already sending heat waves up from the brown dirt surface of the camp. Chuba was waiting just outside the entrance to Headquarters. I hurry up this morning, help my father. 
Now I can show you the rest of camp. Chuba's father was in charge of the servants in the camp. My father number one boss here, Chuba told Biff proudly. The boys roamed around for more than an hour. Chuba chattered on as fast as any of the monkeys scampering about the trees which fringed the camp. Are there elephants around here? Biff asked. Yesterday morning I thought I saw one out of my bedroom window. Sure, sure, much elephants, wild ones, Chuba grinned. But one you saw must be Susie. She dig it here big. That means likes it here, Chuba explained. Biff smiled to himself. When they clear jungle to make the camp, many elephants used to push over trees and pull them away. When job is done, Susie and Tiny, that's the other elephant, they won't leave. So who can make an elephant go when he no want to? They stay on. Where did you pick up all this jive talk, Chuba? Biff asked. Jive talk, you mean talk like American boys. They don't all talk that way. Jive talk is American slang. Some boys use it more than others. I learn it from muscles. He has many magazines come to him by the mail from United States. Many books of the comics, too. You like to meet up with muscles? He come back from Rangoon early this morning. I sure would, Biff said. There was no mistaking muscles. Biff spotted him as soon as they entered the hangar. The plain maintenance mechanic, wearing only short shoes and a long white mechanic's coat, towered over the small natives whom he was directing. Big was the word for muscles. Biff could only compare him with some of the giant linesmen he had seen play for the Chicago Bears professional football team. He and his father went to the games in Chicago every now and then. As the boys approached the plane Muscles was working on, they saw the powerful man heave an oil drum off the floor as if it were made of tissue paper. The drum could have weighed anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds. He upended the drum, and a heavy stream of thick oil flowed smoothly to the intake pipe. Muscles held the drum steadily for a couple of minutes. That ought to do it, he said, and put the drum back on the floor. He looked at the boys. Well now, if it isn't my young friend and number one boy, Chubber. Hey, did you have a visitor yesterday morning? A big grin cracked across Muscles' face. It was clear that Muscles had a great liking for the Chinese boy. Friend, no friend, Chuba replied. He didn't want Muscles to think he had been frightened by what Chuba now called his evil spirit box. I find evil spirits in my room. They make with strange noises, like wild animals howling. Yeah, Muscles was all interest. So what gave? Did the evil spirit send you? I send them. I take evil spirit's hand, shake it good, and evil spirit's howl became a purr of pussycat. Didn't scare you? Gosh, and that thing cost me twenty bucks to have it sent out from the States. Muscles was disappointed. Biff grinned. Chuba had carried the thing off well. He wasn't going to give Muscles the satisfaction of knowing how really frightened he had been. And you must be Biff Brewster, Muscles turned away from Chuba. Charlie Keene's nephew. You're right the first time, Muscles. I sure heard a lot about you, particularly from Chuba. I'm going to make an American kid out of that rascal, no matter what. Say, I'm awfully sorry about your uncle. He paused as he saw a worried look come over Biff's face. Then he hurried on rapidly. But don't worry, Charlie Keene can take care of himself. He always has. I was with him in Korea, and I know. He'll get back. If he doesn't, we'll go in and get him. Going into Red China to hunt for his uncle had been a thought growing more and more prominent in Biff's mind. If no word came from Uncle Charlie soon, Biff knew that he couldn't just sit around and wait any longer. He'd have to do something. After a few more minutes of talk with Muscles, Biff and Chuba left the hangar. Biff was silent as they walked across the hot field to the shade of a small coconut palm grove. Chuba kept rattling on, but his words just bounced off Biff's ears. Biff seated himself against the leaning trunk of a palm. Sit down a minute, Chuba. 
I want to ask you some questions. Shoots, Chuba will make with the answers. Biff frowned. Tell me, just how tough would it be to slip across the border into China? For Chuba, easy, very easy. I do it many times. How about me? Think I could get across? Not by yourself, but with Chuba for number one guide. The native boy shrugged his shoulders. I know all trails. I know just where red border patrol guards strong and where they guard weak, afraid to guard some places. Why is that? Wild animals, black bears, fierce, big, kill a man with one big swipe with paw. Also tigers and leopards, snakes too, all kinds. They hang from trees. Big pythons slide off tree, wrap around man's neck and gurgle, gurgle. Chuba made a rattling noise in his throat. No more man. Biff swallowed hard. And you go over the border in a place where all the wild animals are. Sure, Chuba boasted. Chuba smell and see animals before they see Chuba. It's safer to go into China that way. That way? Safer? What do you mean? Red patrols stay close to main road. Sometimes they let kids like me through. But if they angry or their big boss chew him out, then they don't care whether you kid or not. They shoot you or catch you and make you work like slave. Once you enslave labor camp, you never come back. Biff was silent. You think maybe you like to go in, find your Uncle Charlie. Put snatch on him from red baddies. Something like that, Chuba. Think we could do it? Chuba didn't answer too quickly. His thin face was screwed up in thought. Be most rough, but we smart. Most patrol dumb. Maybe all go well. Maybe not. Biff didn't want to hear any more. His mind was made up. If they had a fifty-fifty chance of finding Uncle Charlie, then that was all he wanted. Meet me back here in an hour, Chuba. I want to talk to Sahib Jack. Biff found Jack Hudson in the communications centre, poring over a large map of China. Biff moved to his side. Trying to figure out where Charlie might be, Jack said. He pointed to a position on the map. No, if you drew a line from Chungking to Chengchu, I'd say he was somewhere west of that line. Biff leaned closer. Why do you think he's in that area? he asked. Well, I do remember Charlie mentioning a small place called Jaraminka about two, maybe three weeks ago. He just received a letter from his friend Ling Tang back in the States. Right after that, he went into Rangoon for a few days. I do know that there's a village by that name somewhere in that area. Rough country? Biff asked. In spots, it's north of the Yunnan Plateau, in the foothills of the Mount Minka Konka. And some of those foothills would be called mountains back where you come from, Jack smiled. Anything else to go on? Biff wanted to know. Well, we don't know how much gas Charlie was carrying. Enough for about 1,200 miles. He'd have to allow for a safety margin. As I told you, I figure he planned on about 500 miles in. And 500 back, of course. That would give him a 200-mile safety factor. Jack leaned back against the map table, scratched his head and lit a cigarette. Another thing, that radio signal we got. You mean the one yesterday? Yes. Now, if that was your uncle calling, you're still not sure it was Uncle Charlie. Well, I guess I am. Let's say it was. That's another reason I figure he's over towards the mountain range. I'm not reading you too clearly right now, Biff said. Jack laughed. I'll try to explain. Charlie had a portable radio transmitter with him, a good one, battery operated. Its maximum range would be about 500 miles under ideal conditions. That means he'd have to have straight line transmission. You mean nothing in the way like a high mountain? That's right, Biff. Transmission is greatly reduced if your wave has to bend over hills or mountains. So you figure he's got to be high enough to shoot a straight wave directly to Unheo. Jack nodded his head, and the elevation around Jeraminka really fills that bill. 5,000 to 6,000 feet. How could he ever land in such rugged terrain? Biff asked. Plenty of small plateaus. Some of them have been cleared for farming. Biff picked up a drawing compass. 
He adjusted its opening to fit the 500-mile mark on the scale of miles at the bottom of the map. Then he placed the steel point of the dot marking Unheo. He swirled the compass. The pencil end cut right through the area Jack was describing. Nice figuring, Jack. A faraway look floated across Biff's face. Hey, you're not getting any ideas, are you? Jack demanded. An American boy could never make it across the border. Natives, sure, but you, never. Maybe not, thought Biff, but in his thoughts he was already there. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Into the Jungle. A light skinned boy could never make it. That thought, first suggested by Chuba, restated by Jack Hudson, kept running through Biff's head. The Chinese Red's border patrol would spot a white boy instantly. Biff remembered stories he had read of Americans captured in Red China. The stories weren't pleasant. Biff left headquarters house deep in thought. He walked slowly across the compound. Chuba was waiting for him in the palm grove. Biff has big thoughts, was Chuba's greeting. Maybe Chuba can help. Maybe you can, Chuba. Maybe you just can. I've got an idea. See what you think of it. For fifteen minutes Biff spoke to Chuba. At first the native boy kept shaking his head. Then, as Biff's enthusiasm mounted, Chuba was swept up by the idea. Negative shakes of the head became excited head shakes of agreement. Chuba's eyes lighted up. Now he cut in on Biff's enthusiasm with bursts of his own. He took over Biff's plan and added to it. Biff was a hard one to resist when he became enthusiastic about anything he wanted to do. And this he meant to do. We can do it, Biff, Chuba said. There was no holding the boy now. I get things ready on double quick. Have much ideas, but will take time. How much time, Biff demanded. Two hours, maybe three. Then you come to the house of my father. You know, where you saw evil spirit box. Chuba be all ready. Chuba, you're a really smooth operator. Like real American boy? You said it. Chuba's mouth was split into a wide grin of pride. No praise could have pleased him more. Toward late afternoon, Jack Hudson ran his hand over his forehead. He was tired. He hated paperwork. All afternoon, he had been poring over files, checking bills, answering letters. The work had to be done, but he wished there was someone else to do it. Action, that's what he liked not sitting at a desk in a hot room. As cluttered as his mind was with facts and figures, the thought of his missing friend, Charles Keane, kept coming back again and again. Jack thought of Biff, too. He didn't like the idea he felt sure was building in Biff's mind. Too risky, of course. But, he told himself, this sitting around, just waiting, was getting him down, too. With an impatient sweep of his arm, Jack shoved the papers away from him. He stretched, got up and made for the front entrance of headquarters house. On the raised platform, six steps above the ground, Jack stopped to light a cigarette. As he did so, his attention was caught by a beggar boy coming at a run across the compound. The boy reached the foot of the steps and sprawled on the ground. Bakshish Sahib! Bakshish, the boy wailed. Jack Hudson looked down at the boy. His feelings of disgust mingled with one of sympathy. These poor kids, he thought, trained to beg from the day they could walk. Bakshish, the word for a tip, a present, was used in many places in the East and Far East. Bakshish, Bakshish, the boy continued to moan. Jack looked about him. He spotted Chuba's father. 
Ti Peo, come here. Chop, chop. Ti Peo came on the run. He could tell Sahib Hudson was annoyed. You know my orders, Ti Peo. No beggars allowed in the compound. How did this boy get in? Ti Peo shrugged his shoulders. Maybe slip through gate or hide in truck coming through. Well, get him out of here. You know that twice a week we hand out food and arms to the beggars. They are not to come inside. Bakshish, Sahib, Bakshish, the plea came again. Take him away, T. Peo. Jack Hudson turned and started to re-enter the building. As he did so, the beggar said softly, No Bakshish, not even coke money. Jack whirled round. The beggar boy was already heading for the gate. Jack scratched his head. I could have sworn, he said. Nah, I must have been hearing things. Must be the heat, he mumbled to himself. He shook his head and went through the door. The beggar boy neared the gate, then cut to the left. He raced through the palm grove, then carefully, stealthily, made his way to the cabin of T. Peo. There was just a flash of brown ragged clothing as he slipped through the door. It work, it work, Biff! Chabba danced up and down in his excitement. The beggar boy grinned. It was the grin of a happy Biff Brewster. I'll say it worked. Even your father didn't recognize me. Not Sahib Hudson either? Biff shook his head. No, I fooled him completely. I even spoke some American words. Of course, I said them low, just as I was leaving. Don't know whether he heard them or not. Let me take a closer look, Chuba said. Biff turned slowly around as Chuba made his inspection. It's much okays. I only afraid sweat make betel nut juice get all smeary. I was afraid of that too, Chuba, but the stain didn't run. Biff looked as much like a native boy as Chuba did. The tattered shorts and torn shirt that he wore had been dug up by the always astonishing Chuba. Biff's face, his body, his legs, were stained a light yellowish brown. This had been done with the juice of betel nuts, mixed and thinned with still another liquid to lighten the blackish fluid crushed from the betel. On his feet, Biff wore floppy, torn sandals. Only one thing, Biff, your eyes should be more slanty, I fix. Chuba took out a piece of charcoal. At the outside corners of each of Biff's eyes, Chuba deftly applied upward strokes with the charcoal. He stepped back to view his handiwork. Then he went into a gale of laughter. You much China boy now. No one could tell difference. Just call me the Chop Suey Kid, Biff laughed. Chop Suey Kid? What's Chop Suey? You never heard of it? Chuba shook his head. Well, back in America, it's our favorite Chinese food. Chuba looked puzzled. He still didn't get it. He shrugged it off. Now we all set. No border guard ever spot you. Never tell you, American boy. Biff had passed his test. Neither Jack Hudson nor, even more important, T. Peo had penetrated his disguise. Okay then, Chuba, we're all set. It's still an hour before the night mess call. I think we'd better be well on our way by then. I'll be missed when I don't show up for chow. And Jack Hudson will guess where I've headed. But by then it will be too late, too dark, to start a search. What about food and other stuff? All set. Chuba has everything. Even bottle of juice in case you start turning back into white boy. We got food for two days. After that, Chuba get more wherever we are. All right, Chuba. Now I'm really going to let your father put me out the gate. I'll follow the river until I reach the second bend. Then I'll wait for you. All is good. Chuba be right after you. Not look good for me to leave here with lowly beggar boy. Chuba grinned, and Biff returned his smile. That night, by nine o'clock, the two boys were deep in the swampy jungle between the Irrawaddy River and the border of China. 
End of chapter 9「Ten of the Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, The Barrier. Night turned the Burmese jungle into a frightening enemy. Towering trees, teak, acal, ironwood, shot straight upward, so close-packed and dense that they blotted out the starlit sky. Vines, some of them as thick as a man's arm, were forever stretching low across the boy's path, as if trying to hold them back from their bold venture. What bothered Biff most of all was the sickening smell of the jungle. Rotted vegetation gave off a rank, stifling odour. Biff had been in the jungles of Brazil, but they were nothing compared to the one he and Chuba were forcing their way through. During the two hours they had travelled in the waning daylight, their progress had been swift. Chuba knew the trails well. Sometimes, moving at a trot several steps ahead of Biff, the native boy would seem to be swallowed by hedges of low, thick brushwood, but he would reappear, parting the thick growth so that Biff could follow. Moving swiftly, silently, without talking to conserve their breath, Biff was suddenly startled. From directly overhead came a chorus of angry screams. Biff stopped and looked up. Only monkeys, Biff, Chuba called back. We wake them from their sleep, and they no like. Come. Once again Chuba took up his steady pace. Thorny bushes grabbed at Biff's already tattered clothes. Ugly scratches marked his legs. Most upsetting was the unexpected change from dry land into dank, oozing swampland. Chuba never stopped or gave any warning of what lay ahead. Time and again the native boy plunged into a narrow stream. Once the water, muddy, almost hot, came up to Biff's waist. As he neared the opposite bank, he halted a moment to look back. Biff, Biff, hurry, out of the water! Biff leapt for the bank just as a partly submerged log moved swiftly through the water to the spot where he had been standing. As it reached the bank, the log's jaws opened, and Biff heard the chilling sound of teeth gnashing together. Crocodile Biff, never stop in stream. Old Croc might be hungry. If he likes mud-flavoured boy, I'm his dish, Biff thought. After travelling for six hours with only brief rest, the boys were bone-weary. Biff figured it must be midnight or a little after. They had reached a small clearing, a circle about thirty feet across. Towards one side a single ironwood tree rose high above the surrounding underbrush. "'We stop here for the night,' Chuba said. "'You ever sleep in tree?' "'Once. Didn't find it very comfortable, though. Do we have to?' "'It's much better. This tree has nice big limbs.' Find good crotch, settle in, and sleep real good. Too many animals on the ground, animals and insects. Big ants, geckos, even wild pigs. You know gecko is big slimy lizard. Wild pigs don't care what they eat, and ants sting real bad. Much better in tree. Chuba stood at the base of the tree. You give me push up to first limb. Then I can give you my hand to pull you up. Come on. Biff didn't reply or move. His eyes were intent on a vine that hung down from one of the higher limbs. It seemed to sway slightly, but there was no breeze. Back, Chuba, back, Biff shouted. Chuba leapt backward. Biff, fascinated, watched the vine stretch downward, then slither off the branch and plunge downward. Python, Chuba cried out. Yes, python, I've seen them before. Not pythons like that one, but boas. Boa constrictors of South America. They're of the same family. The boys now stood in the centre of the circle. The python, nearly twenty feet long, seemed to stare at Biff and Chuba. Then it slowly slithered into the underbrush. Biff looked at Chuba. The native boy lowered his head. Is Chuba's mistake. 
Always my father tell me to be sure and check sleeping tree for python. Chuba forget this time. If Biff not so alert, maybe python now be round Chuba's neck instead of deep in forest. Any chance of its coming back? If it went up that tree once, why shouldn't it come up again? And with us up there? Oh no, once snake scared away, it not come back. This Chuba knows. Python climb up tree to attack enemies by dropping down. Never climb up to find enemies. Well, I just hope you're right. Come on, let's hop into our upper berths. Upper berths? Chuba asked. Biff explained, and the two boys climbed up the tree to their sleeping quarters. Biff watched Chuba as he nestled down on a stout limb forming a crotch with the trunk of the tree. Chuba stretched out backward, his legs on either side of the tree trunk. Biff did the same. At first the position was most uncomfortable. Biff felt he had to keep his knees tightly pressed against the tree trunk to keep from falling. Gradually, though, he squirmed into a position where his legs dangled down, each touching the trunk with just enough pressure to keep him balanced. Some bed, Biff thought. Then, his body aching from the battling his way through the jungle, Biff slept. Early in the morning, with the sun fighting to send its rays through the dense jungle, Biff was awakened by a call from just above him. Chuba was about five limbs higher up. Good sleep, Biff, Chuba called down. Before answering, Biff tested his cramped arms and legs. He was stiff all over. Sleeping in a tree might be safe, but it certainly was no feather bed. He knew, though, that after half an hour in the hot, steamy jungle, he would sweat all the stiffness out of his body. Guess so. I slept anyway, he called up to Chuba. Then we go down and be on our way. We should reach the border in two more hours. The sun had brightened the circular opening below, about the only spot where the sun's rays could get through. Biff heard Chuba scrambling down from above him. Then he looked down and gasped. There, in the centre of the circle, stretched out asleep, was the most magnificent animal he had ever seen. Hold it up there, Chuba, Biff said softly. The scrambling stopped. Can you see down through the leaves? Chuba's answering gasp told him that he could. The animal below, enjoying a morning snooze, was a tiger. Both boys held their breath, afraid that even the slightest sound might awaken the sleeping beast. Moments passed, then in a whisper Biff asked, What do we do now? Chuba's answering whisper came down through the leaves. We wait, Biff, all we can do. If we try to scare him away, he get mad, wait for us to fall out of tree and eat us. Chuba's knowledge, Biff realised, was mixed up with superstition and tales handed down from one generation to another. Tigers, Biff knew, were man-eaters only in certain circumstances. A wounded tiger would attack a man. So would one so old that it could no longer get its food easily. Then, man, less quick, less nimble than the animals tigers usually fed on, could well become the evening meal of a tiger. Biff looked down at the sleeping animal. Its sleek, glistening fur told him that this was a young tiger. Its white, furry underbelly was puffed out. That tiger had had a good meal. Biff knew. Probably caught his breakfast just before daylight, and now he was having a nice nap in the sun. Is he still sleeping? Chuba whispered. Like a baby after its morning bottle, Biff whispered back. Biff didn't think the tiger would sleep too long, not as the morning sun rose higher and its fiery rays burned down on the opening. Once they hit Mr. Tiger, the animal would move off to a shady spot and complete his rest. As Biff watched the animal, the jungle suddenly came alive with the screeching, cawing and screaming of hundreds of birds and animals. The tiger sat up quickly. It rose to its feet, its long tail twitching back and forth. Then it opened its mouth in a gaping yawn, showing glistening white teeth and fangs. It turned its head from side to side, looking to spot any danger. That noise from the monkeys, Chubba called down, or maybe wildcats, 
they chasing the parrots, all very mad at each other. Good for them, Biff called back. They woke up our friend down there. I think old Tiger's going to move along. Biff watched the tiger. He saw it stretch, arching its back very much like any tomcat. It slowly trotted out of the clearing into the dense undergrowth. Tiger's gone, Chuba. We'll wait a while, then let's take off from here fast. Biff had no way of counting the passing minutes. He had left his watch back at Unheo. It would be a fatal error, he knew, if a Chinese beggar boy was spotted wearing a wristwatch. He forced himself to wait. He wanted to be sure that the tiger was long gone to another sleeping spot. The minutes went by as the sounds of the jungle grew louder and louder. Crows added their angry caws to the symphony of sounds coming from herons, silver pheasants, and other birds. I think it's safe now, Chuba. What do you think? Biff's answer was the sound of Chuba scrambling down from his perch. OK, Biff, we go. The boys climbed down, dropping the final ten feet to the ground. Chuba opened his bundle and took from it two handfuls of cooked rice. They ate as they took up their trek once again, scooping up a handful of water from the first clear stream they came to. After travelling an hour, at which time the sweat was pouring off Biff's body, soaking his ragged clothes, Chuba stopped. We're not far from the border now, Biff. Maybe another hour, maybe less, until we get there. And where we cross, there won't be any border guards, Biff asked. Chuba doesn't think so. Main road where guard always patrols is south of here, almost a day's walk. The path we on leads to small, narrow river. River is boundary between Burma and China. Where we cross is a small clearing, river not deep there, only up to knees, easy to get to other side. The other side was China. The thought sent a thrilling chill through Biff's body. We move with much quiet now, Chuba said. Stay close together. Might be others at clearing. Not guards, but maybe Chinese bandits. They use this path too, when they fleeing Chinese soldiers. Biff and Chuba moved quickly but cautiously along the trail. Every few yards Chuba would stop, straining to catch any unusual sound that might warn of danger ahead. At every hidden turn in the path, Chuba would crawl forward, then signal to Biff that all was clear to come ahead. We're almost there now, Chuba whispered. Around next bend in path, we come to clearing and the river. Go slow now, most careful. The boys seemed to move ahead by inches. They neared the final bend. On reaching it, Chuba slipped off the path, pressing his body behind a large palm tree. Biff came up behind, looking over Chuba's shoulder. They craned their necks round the tree trunk until the edge of the clearing came in sight. Looks like it's all clear, Biff said. Chuba nodded his head. They left the protection of the tree darting from one low bush to another. They came to the edge of the opening. All was clear in the opening on their side of the river. Then, raising their heads, they looked across the thirty feet of water separating them from China. Both drew back quickly. Two men wearing peaked, long-billed caps sat in the middle of the clearing on the opposite bank. Red stars on the front of their caps told the boys who they were. Not bandits, not others seeking a safe passage from one country to the other. These two men were members of the border patrol. The two ugly, snub-nosed submachine guns were further proof, if further proof was necessary. Biff shot a quick look at Chuba. For the first time Biff saw fear, stark terror, written on the native boy's face. End of chapter 10